welcome. Yeah, why don't we stand up and uh, we'll get started. All right. All right, this is an arts camp song, so if you were involved, I expect you to be doing the hand motions. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. Now that we're warmed up, why don't you take a minute and turn to your neighbor and just say good morning. May the peace of Christ be with you today on this extraordinarily warm but lovely day. Okay, we've got a fun service ahead. Our own Sharon Richards is going to be uh, speaking today, <laughs> and I'm very excited.
But first, uh, let's uh, prepare ourselves for that time with some worship. And uh, to help us do that this morning, we're going to turn to Colossians 1, 15 through 20. You are the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All things were created by you and for you. And you are the head of the body, the church. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in you and through you. God, this morning we come before you as your people. Lord, we uh, are so thankful for the day, for this community that you've given us. Lord, uh, bless this time. Lead us into your presence, God, and let us be.
addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loves the
when my when I was growing up, my dad was a pastor of a church, and uh, every once in a while he would get up on stage and lead us in in the song. And I want to share it or remind you of it. It's been a long time since I've sang this, but it goes like this: Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 what you've done here, what you've done in us. We praise you for what you will do through us, God. The hope that you've given us and the eternity that you have for us, Lord. Let's just sing it one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's continue as kingdom people by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, Son, and Spirit, you are love, a community of perfect love. You invite us to a most 
intimate of love with you, the divine, inviting us to run to you as a child runs into the arms of a father. Our father. You invite us both into the community of the Trinitarian love and into a community where we can live out this love with each other. Our Father. You invite us into a love that extends beyond ourselves and your church into a world that desperately needs this love. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth, in this country, in this community, in each family. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in this world as it is in heaven. This morning we gather to celebrate this love, to learn from this love, to grow in this love, and to go forth to share this love. Thank you for the privilege of gathering, of being together. Forgive us for often taking the beauty of this community for granted. Teach us to both rest in your love and to grow in our love for you, for each other, and for your world. We lift up our ministry partners in Albania, Yuli and Obana and their precious children, Lydia, Mateo, Tamot, and Luca. Remind them of your great love and pleasure in them as they faithfully love their community. Give them glimpses of your hand at work and sustain them as they seek you and share your love. Protect them, Lord, from discouragement. Honor them and hold them near. Be near, too, this morning to our neighbor church journey. Encourage their pastor, Reverend Kristen Saldine, their leaders, and all those who gather there. May they have an increased awareness of your presence and may Journey Church be a place of healing and hope here in Folsom. Thank you for our abundant blessings. We recognize that all we have comes from your hand and is only ours to steward. Receive our offering today as a tiny testament of our love and use it to extend your love both inside and outside this church. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A few weeks ago, Jenny Zhang uh, spoke on the beauty of poetry in the scriptures, and uh, she used what we used as our call to worship from Colossians. And uh, after hearing her speak on that, I just got inspired to write a song, and I'd like to share it with you now. His name is Jesus, He is Messiah, He is one with the Father, the Spirit, He is the only Son, He is the King, He has a supremacy, He is the head of the body, the church, He is the beginning.
falling We've been reconciled Welcomed into the family Presenting our holy and blameless through His blood Well, at this time, it's my privilege to get to introduce you to one of my favorite people. Now, I know she doesn't, it sounded like from earlier when Jordan said she was going to speak, she probably doesn't need a lot of introduction, but I get to talk about somebody I really love, so it's still kind of fun. Um, Sharon Richards is a elder here at our church. She is a mother of two amazing children. She's a grandmother of two of the most adorable twin boys you have ever seen and in about to be a grandmother of a little baby girl. And um, most importantly to me, she is one of my dearest friends. She was one of my first friends when I moved here to California almost 22 years ago. And she has walked with me through some pretty dark valleys, as well as seasons of light and joy. She's amazingly strong, incredibly wise, a true lover of God, and always seeking to live out what it means to love in tangible ways. So I know you're going to love hearing from her. Come on up, Sharon. Thank you, Colini. Oh, well, it's good to be here, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see some of my friends here. Um, Colleen's already kind of introduced me, but just a little bit more background. I've been at Oak Hills for about 28 years or so, and I was on staff for about 14. And um, I, I just have to say that 
when I came to Oak Hills, I did have a church background, um, but it was really very limited. I had a limited understanding of Christianity and of church. Um, frankly, I had a weak, very self-centered faith with a, a very narrow view of God. And I had no understanding of how he wanted to be part of my daily life. Um, I had granted him kingship over certain portions of my life. Do you hear the immaturity in that? I let him rule over what I wanted him to rule over. Um, but thankfully, through the years, I've come to better understand what is required of me as a Christ follower and what it means to live in community and within a church community. And I'm still learning. But here's one thing I do know. When talking about faith as well as community, it's really about relationships. Our personal relationships with Jesus as well as our relationships with others. Admittedly, with a sermon series entitled, What's on My Mind, it has really been a challenge for me to focus on one thing. And even now, fair warning, I may go rogue off script to see what happens. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I'm just giving you a heads up. We could be here for 10 minutes. We could be here for an hour and a half. I don't really know. But there's been a lot going on, obviously, this past year. Between the pandemic, isolation, politics, and rampant and blatant racial injustice. I've been rocked. This has been a hard year. In some situations, things didn't or aren't working the way I wanted them to or thought that they would or even how I prayed they would work out. The season that I've been in, while painful, has been good for me. It's required me to do a deep dive into my resilience and my reliance on God. So yeah, I didn't always feel good, but it's been good for me. It's brought me closer to God because there are so many things that were beyond my control. It required me to remember that God is in control, not me. And to some degree, there's freedom in just acknowledging that and releasing it and letting God do his work. For many of us here today, we're here because at some point we surrendered. We gave up control. We acknowledged that we needed Jesus. For some, that re realization came out of a desert experience through difficulties and trials that brought us to our knees. For others, it was a euphoric mountaintop experience, the birth of a child, or a breathtaking view that brought us to a place where we realized that only God could have done that. Whatever your story, and we each have a story, we surrendered to or acknowledged and gave credit to Jesus. We gave up, we gave in, and Jesus was there, ready and uh, waiting to welcome us. So, let me tell you what's been on my mind. Reconciliation. We are a broken people living in a broken world. As believers, though, we know that God sent Jesus as a solution to the world's problems. Jesus came to restore peace by reconciling all of creation to God. Reconciliation is restoring what is broken. One of the outcomes of this past year for me has been my resolve to live a life of reconciliation. There's nothing lofty about those words. As a Christ follower, that's my job. As Christ followers, that's our job, to live lives of reconciliation. Listen. I've said this in other venues. I cannot be an authentic 
Christ follower over here and have the rest of my life over here. It doesn't work. I don't want to be a phony. I don't want to live a double life. It's too exhausting. I want to live a life with integrity. We've been reconciled because of Jesus. He's here and he's ready to help us to live our lives as he had intended. There's a lot of angry and frustrated people all around us. But as Christ followers, we have to do better. I don't know what that looks like for you. I know what it looks like for me. It means to start being honest with myself, to look at the dark parts of my heart that I try to keep hidden from God and from you guys, and to confess it. Because once I confess it, once I admit it, once I expose it, then I can submit it to God. And he can help me heal. Why? Because Jesus came and ransomed himself and reconciled us to God. And you know what it means? It means I have to be an active participant in the call as a Christ follower, even in my brokenness. It's more than just showing up on Sunday mornings. That's the easy part. It means showing up out there in the world, at the grocery store, on the freeway, at Costco, at work, at school, at home, in our conflicts. That's our calling to be peacemakers. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. I'm going to read this. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting the people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Listen to verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Did you hear that? Do you grasp that? We are therefore, we, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. That rocks me to my core. I, we, must be his hands, his feet, his voice, agents of shalom, peacemakers, representatives of Christ. God wants to use us now in all of our relationships. So with that verse in mind, take a moment to think of a situation or a relationship in your life, a relationship where disunity exists, perhaps where you have felt wronged or misunderstood, or perhaps in a situation where you feel justified in what you said or did, and it backfired on you. Do you have that person or situation in mind? Now. Because of who Jesus is and what he did for us, was there or is there a better way to approach that person or situation? In light of who Jesus is and how he has shown each of us such incredible grace and mercy, can we not extend or at least try to extend the same to each other? Could that relationship be made better since we are Christ's ambassadors and scripture says that God is making his appeal through us? Je Jesus demonstrated how to live and navigate in difficult situations and with difficult people. He knew his purpose and he stayed on track. He loved and extended grace even as he hung on the cross. So I'm committed to a life of reconciliation, even though I screw up sometimes. I'm asking God to help me. I'm asking myself this question. Am I doing a good job of representing Jesus? Am I doing a good job of representing Jesus in my personal life, 
in my private thoughts, in my conversations, in conflicts and disagreements. I don't always do a good job, but I'm trying. I'm trying to develop my empathy muscle, to strengthen my grace muscle. Why? Because I'm called to do so. And because I want to live, I want to live a life that is honoring to Jesus and his sacrifice. Romans 12, 18 says this. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now understand that just because we may feel remorse or feel ready to confess a wrong, the person we wronged may not be in a space or a place to forgive us or even to listen to us. But we can still lay down our pride and our arrogance and confess to our God who's always listening. And that, my friends, is the beginning of the reconciliation process. It begins with interior work. I have relationships right now that need repair. I'm trying to understand what my role in the messiness may have been and to take responsibility for it. I confess to you that I have prayed selfish prayers that God would do a mighty work in, you know, fill in the person's name. But those empty prayers were not for their benefit. They weren't sincere. Those prayers were for my benefit because the fulfillment of those prayers would make my life easier. Am I the only person who's done that? Really? Okay, I'm the only person who's done that. <laughs> okay. When I pray those selfish prayers, you know what that really does? It makes God small and it relegates him to being my personal genie, as if he works for me. It robs me of leaning into my faith. It robs me of giving God the opportunity to develop me to be a better ambassador of reconciliation. In those kinds of prayers, I'm not taking responsibility for anything. I'm no longer teachable. Patience and kindness can't reach my heart. Seeing the good in a situation or a person is not possible because I'm not acknowledging that the person I'm in disunity with is also a child of God. If I did, I'd approach that conflict differently. So let's suppose you're in a fractured relationship right now. You want to talk it out or hug it out and that person just isn't there yet, what should you do? Well, doing nothing is no longer an option. Our faith is an act of faith. How about you begin with the act of confession? That's action. So perhaps in a relationship and situation that is fractured, the first thing to do is to bring it before God. Confess your part in it or your confusion about it. Don't turn your prayer into a closing argument pleading your case to God. I've done that too. Instead, with humility, talk to him. Cry out to him. Ask him for clarity. And then listen and wait and listen. Or maybe move forward. I don't know. I suspect it depends on what you're talking to God about. But whatever he tells you, try to seek some type of peaceful resolution. Peaceful resolution. And that means whether it's peace with that person or that situation or the peace that comes from surrendering your ability to change the situation. Now, I imagine that words like peace and reconciliation 
injustice, especially in our current culture, conjures up all kinds of things. It causes some people to fix their jaw and cross their arms and have a visceral reaction to those words because they see those words as weak, as conciliatory. But remember, words like peace, reconciliation, justice, those words are strong words, straight out of scripture. Reconciliation is one of the goals of the gospel. We cannot enter into contentious conversations and situations with the idea of winning or being right or being offended. At the heart of reconciliation, there must be humility, not winning. We cannot approach any fractured relationship with a determination to get what we want. A determination to get what we want is bullying, not reconciliation. The very essence of reconciliation means we come together to the table with a goal of resolving the issue. To let go of our tight grip, to be teachable, even if it's scary and we're afraid of what will happen next. We are trusting God because over and over and over again, he has proven that he is trustworthy and knows best for us. We are growing in our faith. We must be willing to yield to what God is trying to accomplish. Reconciliation takes commitment and work and resolve. It's hard. Some of us would rather throw up our hands and walk away from what we don't like. We refuse to engage. We pull out the silent treatment. We want to ignore the elephant in the room. We don't want to talk about it anymore. We're over it. Let's move on. Let's pretend it didn't happen. It's so much easier to villainize that person or that group or that situation but I believe that God is glorified when we commit to staying engaged and being peacemakers. God is glorified when we resolve to work this thing, to wrestle with it, to listen to each other. Now, whatever it is, it might not be resolved in my timing or how I want it, but I'm not going to let my arrogance, my impatience, my desire to be in control, my fear of change, or my lack of knowing or agreeing or approving to get in the way of what God might be up to. Why? Because I'm committed to being faithful, to trusting God, even if I don't understand what he's up to. So here's the question. Who do you follow? Do we not follow Jesus? Shouldn't Christians be an example? Christ followers out there, this is our time to step up. Isn't that our calling? To be an example to the world? Perhaps one reason Christians are criticized as hypocrites is because we don't respond in a Christ-like manner in the midst of controversy and conflict. Let's endeavor to do better, to invite God into those spaces and places and conversations, to acknowledge, lament, confess our part in this problem, to extend grace, just like we're extended grace and mercy every day. Our pride, our privilege, our fear, our selfishness, we have to let go. It's not about winning. Let's trust him to do his work. Let's invite him to do his work in us. He wants to. And perhaps more importantly, we should want him to do his work in us. So we may have relationships 
and situations that need help. The stress of isolation and separation have fractured families and friendships. It's been a challenging year. The world seems heavy. Our local, state, national world news can be grim. So we may have broken relationships. But this is not the time for us to put our heads in the sand. This is our time, Christ followers, to show up we have access to the God of the universe. Do you not believe that? We have access to the hope of the world. That's what he does. He's our hope. We need to tap into that and to ask him to help us to be an active participant in the work that he's doing, to ask God to remind us that even the person that we may have a conflict with also bears his image. He has given us our mandate in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. But it boils down to this, love God, love others. Let's stop being frowny-faced, sourpuss Christians. Let's represent Jesus, let's carry ourselves as people confident, not arrogant, confident, confident that we are sons and daughters of the king and that we are his ambassadors, even in the midst of conflict, even if we don't get our way. Remember who God is, what he's done for us, and what he wants for us. Let's invite God into our messes and let him do his work. Listen for him. Trust him in his timing, in his way. Reading from Matthew 5.15 from the message. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. I love that. I love that. Let's pray. Lord, we pray this with expectation. We recommit ourselves to be your hands, feet, heart, and voice. Help us to live out your kingdom principles. Our desire is to be your ambassadors, to demonstrate your presence in our lives. We pray for discernment. Faithful healer, we acknowledge, lament, and confess that we frequently put ourselves before others. We put ourselves and our agenda before you. And yet, our calling is to represent you on this earth in all things. We need help to do that. We die to self, and then in the very next minute, we forget. We try and we try and then fail because we're operating out of our own desires or willpower, which are weak and self-serving. Our heart's desire is to tap into your power and we don't always know how to do that. Would you come alongside us, reveal more of yourself to us, and tend to our brokenness? Help us to loosen our grip and strengthen our faith. And for those of us who are in disunity with others, please, God, heal, restore, and fix those relationships 
the way you want them to be fixed. Forgive us when we doubt you. Amen. Thank you, Sharon.